So, Father, we thank you for your word. Hallelujah. Thank you that your word, Lord, is alive. It is living and active. Thank you, Father, that it is a sharp sword. And it cuts, Lord, but it also restores. And I thank you, Father, that it cuts out the rubbish in our life and restores the good. And I thank you so much for the ministry of your word today. Just bring it with power, Lord, and touch us with your word. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> so, we're in part three today. <laughs> if you haven't seen part one and two, they are online at our YouTube channel. And uh, if you're watching online, you can also find those those there. Um, yeah, so if you want to see part one and two, and this is your first Sunday with us, welcome to our visitors. Just search up Saving Grace Church on YouTube and uh, subscribe to our channel and you'll find those uh, sermons there so you can see part one and two. Never mind though, part three can be a sermon all on its own. So it doesn't matter that you haven't seen part one and two if this is your first day. I will give a brief recap. So let's go to Genesis 12, 1 to 4. The Lord had said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I'll make you into a great nation, and I will bless you, and I'll make your name great, and you will be a blessing. <clears throat> I will bless those who bless you, and whoever uh, curses you, I will curse, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. So <clears throat> he was an old dude, you know, 75. He wasn't a young guy. In fact, there wouldn't be many people here who are 75 or older. I won't ask you to put up your hands. So I won't embarrass you. But he was 75 and God said, pick up your whole family, you know, and get out of this place where you were established and, and go to a place that I've prepared for you. Uh, what's the GPS coordinates? No, I'm not going to give them to you. Just get up and go. <clears throat> so he didn't have some kind of GPS guiding him. He just had the Lord. And he, he set out to a place where God said, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to bless you abundantly. And all nations will be blessed through you. But he had to go somewhere and be planted somewhere. And in that place, God was going to produce a blessing in his life. You see, God prepares a place for us. And he plants us in that place. And that's where he has a purpose for us and a blessing for us. And so we looked at being firmly planted two weeks ago. And the importance of being firmly planted, not being in a pot that you can just move around everywhere from church to church, but being a tree rooted in the ground and your, your, your roots going down into the, the, the deep waters of God's word and allowing your tree to produce fruit. So that, that was the, the message there, a very quick recap about that. And, and last week we looked at reasons why we don't like to be firmly planted and uh, the first one was a commitment problem. The second was a submission problem. The third was a wrong focus on the vessel of authority. Number four was a focus shift problem. And number five was a personal destiny getting in the way of our corporate destiny. And today we're going to look at the final thing that separates us from being firmly planted. And I want to really emphasize that this message today is not just about church. It's about your relationships out there in the world. It's about your marriage. It's about your, your, your relationship with your spouse. It's about your, your relationship at your work. Wherever you are, this message has power to transform relationship because it is such a key in the devil's scheme to separate us from the blessings of God in our life. And it's an offense problem. Let's go to John 16. 
I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. So the Bible doesn't paint this picture that you won't have trouble. In fact, Jesus promises us that offense is going to come our way, that trouble is going to come our way, that people are going to do stuff to us that's going to hurt us. There is nothing that you can do about that. It's going to happen. There is going to be people that drive you up the wall. In fact, <laughs> it was an interesting discussion coming to church with my son Josh today. And he said, Dad, is there something that happens on the road that, you know, drives you crazy? You know, something that someone does. And, you know, we, we all have those experiences on the road when someone cuts you off or someone's driving slow, you know, 60 in a 90 zone. And you kind of get offended at that person. <laughs> you don't even know that person. They don't know you. They are a stranger. You've never met them and yet you're offended. Come on, don't tell me you haven't been there. Yeah, thanks, Mark. I'm not on my own here. <laughs> I'm not on my Robinson Crusoe here. You know, we can have an offense problem with someone we never even met. We don't even know what they look like. We don't even know their, their background or what's happening in their day. But we can get offended just like that. How much more people that we know intimately who are around us all the time, who our expectations are so much higher of. The Greek word for offense is scandalon. This word means the part of a trap where bait is attached. So offense, the Greek word for offense is scandalon. So offense is the part of the trap where you are going to be caught where the bait is attached. Okay, and bait is what attracts us to a trap. And so offense is the bait. But who's putting the bait there? Satan is placing that bait because he wants to catch you in offense. Offenses that come on us or against us all day long are the devil's bait to cause us to stumble and get this, to move from our placement. Why does he want us to move from our placement? Because it's God's purpose for you. It's where God's blessing is. It's where God wants to extend his kingdom in your life. And so Satan does not want you in that place. He wants to move you out of it, whatever he can do, whether it's a marriage, come on, whether it's a relationship, whether it's a, a workplace or it's your church, who, who knows? It's, it's your, your, your mates at school, I don't know. But whatever it is where God has placed you, the devil wants to move you out of that place. Look at what happened to the people of Israel. They wanted to go into the promised land. But they didn't end up going in, you know, because they were offended at what Moses was asking them to do. They were offended at God and they, they, they backed out. They said it's too hard. They were in fear. And so they didn't enter in for 40 years to the place that God had purposed for them. The bait of offense is a stumbling block that causes us to fall. The devil wants you to take his bait to hook you and move you or disconnect you from your placement and from the people God has called you to connect with or even to marry. Come on, there is so many marriages that fall apart. in our. I think it's something like um, 9,000 uh, 9, a week in Australia, marriages fall apart because of offense. Because I'm offended with that person that I'm married with and I don't want to put up with that anymore. And so I'm going to finish it. It's tragic. We all know someone who goes from place to place because of offense. Even marriage to marriage because of offense. When an offense comes and you don't deal with it, it graduates. <laughs> you see, like we're in high school when we get offended or maybe we're even in kindergarten because kind of like it's childish, you know, but... When you don't deal with offense, you graduate to, you know, the next level of schooling. 
you graduate to resentment. And if you don't deal with resentment, you graduate to bitterness. And then if you don't deal with that bitterness, you end up in university, the university of offense. And what is that? It's unforgiveness. And you're about to get a degree in unforgiveness and you're going to hold on to it and you're going to proclaim it for the rest of your life with your bitterness and say, I am not going to forgive that person. And we have met people, you know people, and maybe you are even that person who has held on to unforgiveness in your life. And I tell you, there is not a single bit of ministry in your life that can be done if you hold on to unforgiveness. The first thing that we do in ministry when we're trying to get people set free is ask them, is there anyone you haven't forgiven? Is there anyone you hold something against? Because it is the university degree that we hold so tightly to. And it comes because we don't deal with the offense in our heart at the beginning. When unforgiveness becomes full-blown... You no longer feel you want to forgive the person. Instead, you feel like you want to disconnect from them and move away from your placement. You know, people, when they um, get offended in a church and they don't deal with it in their heart, it becomes resentment and bitterness and then unforgiveness and suddenly they want to move away. They want to disconnect because the devil's bait has been taken and they've eaten it down and become a victim of that trap. Let's go to Proverbs 17.9. It's there for me. Whoever would foster love covers over an offense, but whoever repeats the matter separates close friends. You know someone's offended when they start talking to you about that person in a negative way and they repeat it to you. They haven't dealt with the offense. But love covers over an offense. Okay, and uh, Proverbs 19, 11. A person's wisdom yields patience. It is to one's glory to overlook an offense. So fostering love covers over an offense It is to one's glory to overlook an offense. You know, offenses will come, but how we deal with it is so important because the devil wants us to take the bait. The Bible admonishes us to cover offenses, to stay in our placement, to walk in the love of God. Be prepared every day to cover offenses, but how do we do it? Well, You may have heard of a monkey trap. Monkeys love bananas. And so to trap monkeys, they have a container that has a banana inside it. And they tie a rope to that container. And it's in a tree. And a monkey comes along and he puts his hand in the container and grabs the banana. And when he's holding the banana, he cannot, or she cannot, you know, I don't want to be sexist here. It might be a female monkey, who knows? (laughs) She cannot, or he cannot get his hand out of the trap. And so the, the person who wants to trap that monkey simply pulls on the rope and pulls the monkey out of the tree because the monkey will not let go of that banana. He took the bait, took the offense, and he will not let it go and so the way that we cover over an offense is by constantly forgiving and letting it drop drop that banana you don't want to be caught by the monkey hunter drop it there's plenty more bananas out there (laughs) that aren't a trap you know bananas grow in in a in a bunch right they don't grow in a container So if there's something not right, if there's something too good to be true, it is too good to be true. Bananas are found in bunches on a banana tree, not in a container. So spot it for what it is. It's bait and it wants to catch you. When somebody hurts or offends you, 
one of the ways you can cover that offense is to agree with God that you are not going to tell anybody about it. Wow. That's pretty tough. But that is covering an offense. You're hiding that, you're covering that offense because you're not telling people about it. But what you're doing when you start telling people about that offense, what are you, you're revealing it. You understand? You're revealing that offense because you're telling people about it. And you're probably going to tell a lot of people about it. You're going to reveal that offense. But the Bible tells us to cover the offense. So you make a deal with God that you are not going to tell anybody else about it. Secondary, you need to open your mouth and say, Father God, I forgive, blah, 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 whoever you're offended with. I forgive Pastor Chris <laughs> for preaching that message today. <laughs> And let it drop. So the first thing you do, you say to God, God, give me the strength to not tell anyone about this. Number two, I forgive that person. Number three, you let it drop. Don't eat the bait. Continue to say it until your spirit man begins to agree with your mouth. Because guess what? The first time you say it, you're not going to agree with it. I don't want to forgive them. I don't want, God, look what they did to me. I don't want to forgive. Keep saying it. God, I'm not going to tell anyone about it. I'm going to forgive them. I'm going to, and keep doing it because the devil will keep reminding you because he wants you to take the bait. When you do it enough, your spirit man lines up by faith with your mouth. And suddenly you don't feel anything toward that person anymore because you've gone ahead by faith and God honors that faith. What does offense really mean? Well, it means to offend, means to displease, to affront and to anger. It can build up over a series of smaller things or it can be something massive that just happens in one moment with someone. You know, a, a big event might be you discover, you know, something about someone that they, they told a very terrible lie about you. And so you, you know, that's a one moment event where you get offended. Small things might be just, you know, someone comes late to the music team meeting each day and you slowly get more and more aggravated by this person and then you get offended. <laughs> so, you know, it can be a build up or it can be a one time event. That's not an excuse to come late to a music team meeting, by the way. <laughs> when we cling to the notion, this is really important. When we cling to the notion that we must defend our rights in a matter. That person did something to me, so I'm going to cling to that. My right that I shouldn't have been hurt, I'm going to cling to that. You know what? Jesus came to a cross and died for us and he didn't hang on to his right to be the son of God and to, to, to not go to that cross. He said, Father, I'm going to do it because you asked me to do it. And he died for us and took all of those offenses on him on the cross. But, you know, we've got this habit of trying to crawl off the cross, you know, like, Yank out the nails. I don't know how you even do that, but we don't want to stay there. We, we want to get off because we don't want to. We want to demand our rights. I shouldn't be on the cross. They should be on the cross. No, give up your right to be right. We're even told in the New Testament, would you rather not be wronged by another person then bring the, the name of God and his people into disrepute by going to a court and taking your fellow believer to a court. Would you rather not be wronged? You see, we want to demand our right, our right to be right. But Jesus didn't demand that right. He went to the cross and said, no, I'm going to take your wrongs on me. When we defend our rights in a matter, we will always continually become offended. Because we want our rights. 
And so this, this ongoing demand of wanting what is right in your life, wanting people to do what is right in your life, this expectation, you keep getting offended. Someone will always trespass on the boundaries of how we feel we should be treated. Guys, I'm not making this stuff up. I'm sure there's someone during the week who stepped on the boundaries of how you wanted to be treated this last week and you felt something about that. If it didn't happen last week, it probably happened the week before, but it may have even happened last night. (laughs) It happens all the time. But the greater power is within you. Come on, guys. The greater power, the power that raised Christ from the dead lives in us. And that is the ability to forgive and let Christ's power work in you. You know, I was having an interesting discussion with Harleen and Ike. Rose and I were at their house and and Ike was talking to us about, you know, being offended. You know, people hurting you. And he said, well, even if it's right, we're dead. We're dead to the old man. You know, we're dead to that person who would get offended. I remember going to um, uh, the Philippines uh, to Pastor Ferdy's Bible College and um, the team had paid for their food and so we were getting this food and we were eating with all the other students in the Bible College and they kind of didn't have the same money that we had and when they'd paid for their food, it was not quite as nice a food as the food we were eating. And I was concerned that they would sit there and watch us eating this nicer food and they would feel something about that. And so I said to to Pastor Ferds, I said, look, Ferds, I I, I don't want to create a problem here. I don't want the people to to feel something about the food that we're eating. He said, I don't worry about them, they're dead. (laughs) When they come to this college, they die to all that stuff and they give their life to Christ. You see, the reason why we get offended is because we're not dead. We're not dead to our old man. Our old sinful man rises up and wants to demand our rights. But actually, the Bible tells us consistently, we're dead to that. We're dead to sin. Reckon yourself dead to sin, (laughs) but alive to God in Christ. Amen? So we we love to quote that, but next time you get offended... (laughs) Quote that back at yourself. (laughs) I'm dead to this offense and I'm alive in Christ. Amen. So, you know, we need to understand that these things that the devil brings are a bait to take us from the place or the relationships that God has set up for us. Don't open the door. This is really key because when you open the door, something allows the enemy to come in. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 2, 10 to 11. Anyone you forgive, I also forgive. And what I have forgiven, if there was anything to forgive, I have forgiven in the sight of Christ for your sake. In order that Satan might not outwit us, for we are not unaware of his schemes. And let's go to Ephesians 4, 26 to 27. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. I've gone to bed angry and it never looks good in the morning. (laughs) You know when you wake up and you know you've been angry in the morning before and you haven't sorted it out? It doesn't look good. Even if you slept at all, it doesn't look good. You see, what happens is when we allow anger or unforgiveness in our life, we're allowing the enemy or the devil to stick his foot in the door. Have you ever seen those cop movies or whatever, you know, and the, the cop wants to get into the room and, and um, they knock on the door and, and you open the door and they put their foot there? Or sometimes it's, you know, a thief or a, a bad guy who's come and he puts his foot. So if you try to close the door, you can't because the foot's stopping the door. And that's what happens. You allow a foothold and then the, they can barge in and occupy your life. 
Another way might be thinking of it is like a, a beachhead in your heart so that the enemy wants to, 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 to come and land in your life and he sends these paratroopers, the, the, the offences, and, and, and as we take the bait, the, the paratroopers land on the beach and then the enemy can come in in his ships because the beachhead has been established. The foothold has been given. A fence means a big door wide open for the enemy, the devil in our life. The enemy is always hanging around looking for an opportunity to foster defeat in our life. Stop giving him a foothold. Stop giving him a base of operation in your life. That's what a foothold is. It's giving him a base of operation. You know, when they climb Mount Everest, they have the first place they stop at is called base camp. And base camp is where they come and hang out and then they go back up for a climb and they acclimatize. They, come, they keep going back to the base camp and they store everything at the base camp. And what a foothold is in your life is like you've established a base camp for the devil to hang out and climb that mountain in your heart. His main concern is to advance to the center of your heart. Your place of affection for God. And this is his real plan, you know, not just to separate you from the purpose of God or the blessings of God in your life. He wants to get to the center of your affection for God. Because guess what? If you're you're in offense and you're not forgiving someone, you're not going to be in love with God in that place. In fact, you're going to stop praying. You're going to stop reading the word. Because guess what? When you read the word or you pray, you get convicted. So you don't want to read this thing. You don't want to pray. You don't want to spend time with God. And guess what? Suddenly, the place of affection in the center of your heart for your father disappears. And that's where he wants to be. That's the Everest mountaintop in your heart that he wants to be in. That he takes away your affection for your heavenly father. That place in your heart that is occupied by God. He desires to block your communication with God so that you cannot pray and hear effectively from your Father. But the devil cannot occupy the center of your heart unless we give him a foothold. When we give him a foothold, this gives him permission because we are in pride and pride is his playground. It's where he hangs out, you know, tough guy hangs out in the playground. Well, he's not a tough guy. You can kick him out. Just don't get in that playground. Don't go and hang out in your pride. Harboring offenses is a foothold that the devil needs and uses to progress to developing a stronghold in your life. You see, the foothold becomes the stronghold. And then it's difficult to move him out. Ephesians 4, 30 to 32. Why must we forgive? And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. So why do we do it? Because God says so. God says that we should forgive. Let's go to Mark eleven twenty two to 25. Have faith in God, Jesus answered. Truly, I tell you, if anyone says to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what they say will happen, it will be done for them. We love this verse, right? We love to quote it. Mountain, go into the sea. Introduce your mountain to Jesus and let him chuck it into the sea. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. But then there's another verse. Verse 25, and when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them 
so that your Father in heaven may forgive you your sins. Hebrews eleven six says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. So you see, if we harbor offense, if we will not forgive, our faith won't work. You can't say to that mountain, go throw yourself into the sea. You can't say, I'm going to do this or do that. You can't because your faith won't work when you haven't forgiven. Because the, 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 the verse that tells us what we need to do to see that mountain be thrown into the sea is that we need to forgive so that our Father in heaven can forgive us. This is vital because we need faith in everything we do. We cannot please God without it. And everything we receive from God is by faith. Your faith won't work when you harbor offense. Let's go to James 1, 21 to 22. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Unforgiveness produces filthiness in our inner man. You accumulate dirt in your inner man and we need to be washed by the water of his word. We need to be washed because we're filthy when we harbor unforgiveness. Matthew 6, 14 to 15. This is a very, very powerful scripture. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp. Sorry, 6. 14 to 15. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. So unforgiveness blocks our personal relationship with God. Not only that, it blocks the power of the cross in your life. Because it says, the cross is meaningless to me. It means nothing to me because I'm not willing to apply what the cross did in my life to someone else. And so you actually deny the power of the cross in your life. You deny the power of the blood of Jesus in your life because you say, God, I, I don't care what you did for me. I, I, I can't do that for another person. And you say, the cross has no power to help me forgive. And God says in that place, I can't forgive you. That is a very, very strong word. And I think we don't understand that. I think that we have not taken that to heart. These are the words written in red. They are not in black. Jesus said these words. It's not me that's saying that. And so when we harbor unforgiveness, you know, when we, we graduate to university and we get a degree in unforgiveness, we're actually in a very dangerous place. And that's why, as I said before, that any ministry we do in healing someone in a brokenness in their mind or their spirit begins with forgiveness. Because we must restore forgiveness first. It is so important. It moves us out of our God placement. If you sense you're having difficulty entering God's presence... You should evaluate your life and see if you are harboring offense towards anyone. If there's anyone you haven't forgiven. And, and you can tell. If you check with yourself and see, have I been talking about someone, what they did to me to someone else? That's a very quick way to understand if you're harboring offense in your heart towards that person. You know, if you're feeling that there's some kind of issues going on in your heart, just look back over the last few weeks and see if you've been talking about someone else and what they did to you. If you are, you're harboring offense towards that person. You are uncovering, you are revealing that offense to other people. You are not covering over that offense. And so that's a good way to indicate, am I in a place of forgiveness or am I in a place of offense? What am I talking about? What is my mouth saying? 
I just want to say a word on marriage here um, because I think this is really important. There's two roles in a marriage and I'm just going to go over this very briefly in Ephesians 5. I'll start in verse 22 and then I'll go back to 21. Ephesians 5, 22. Wives, submit yourselves to your husbands, your own husbands, as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is the saviour. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Husbands, note that there is a lot more that you need to do than your wife needs to do, all right? It's like three or four times longer. So take notes. Gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body just as Christ does the church. For we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you must also, also must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. So let me break this down really quickly because I don't want to take a lot of time on this. The wife's role is to respect, submit, and honor her husband. The husband's role is to love his wife. But what does that mean? To die as Christ died for the church, to die for his wife. Now, I don't mean go out and, you know, take your own life physically. I mean to die to your attitudes first, to die to your anger first, to die to your wrong attitudes first. Now, why I'm talking about this is because offense comes in and we kind of say, you know, when my husband starts dying to his anger, I'm going to respect him. I'm going to submit to him. I'm going to love him. And the husband goes, well, when my wife starts to respect me and honor me, then I'm going to die to my anger. What's going on? Offense is going on in the heart. Verse 21. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And I used to wonder about this, this verse because the very next verse tells the wives to submit to their husband and then it says submit to one another. And I, I, I kind of like got into some wrong thinking about this and I asked God about this verse and then he showed me what it meant. He said to Chris, he said to me, Chris, submitting to one another means this. You submit to your role in that marriage without the other person first doing what you expect of them. That's what it means to submit to one another. The wife will submit, respect and honor, even if your husband is not acting as he should, even if he has offended her. And the husband will die to himself, will love his wife and wash her with the word and purify her, even if she's not respecting and honoring him. Because you submit to one another. You submit to your role in that marriage before the other one is even doing it, because Christ came and gave his life for us while we were still enemies. And so we're kind of like waiting because we're offended to the other person to get it right, but we're actually not submitting to our role in that marriage. We're not submitting to what we're supposed to do. We're actually staying in our offense. And so it's very important that we understand marriages have a lot of problems because we're always waiting for the other one to sort themselves out, and then we'll sort ourselves out. No, we are to submit to one another. We are to submit to the role that God ordained in our marriage. And a lot of marriages struggle to overcome issues because they're waiting for the other one to make it right. I really want to encourage you that don't give in to offense in your marriage. Don't give in to it. Dwell in a place of forgiveness and grace and mercy. You know, if, if, if both a husband and wife are willing to submit to those roles, to submit to each other in those roles. It'll be a beautiful marriage. It'll be an incredible marriage. And I, I, you know, it's not that you won't have trouble in your marriage, but you'll have a way out of that trouble. 
you'll fight the fire together. You know, if your house is burning, you fight the fire, you know. But when our, our marriages are burning, we run away from it. You know, we don't want to fight it, but we actually need to fight it. You know, fight for that marriage. Fight for that fire. Put it out. As I said last week, you know, we, we think we're marrying for love, but actually we're marrying for holiness. God is marrying us to equip us and train us in holiness. That's why you see so many people married to their opposite. Like, what is that? <laughs> Wouldn't it make sense to marry someone who's the same as you? Then, like, you'd get on. <laughs> but we seem to marry the opposite. I mean, I've, I've lost track of the number of times I've been sitting with a couple, even sitting with my wife, and thinking she's so opposite to me. <laughs> No wonder it drives me crazy. <laughs> no wonder these two are driving each other. One's an introvert, one's an extrovert. You know, <laughs> how do they even get on in the house? <laughs> because you're not marrying for love. You know, love is this kind of gushy emotional feeling that's the explosion that begins your marriage. <laughs> but you're actually marrying for holiness because God wants to create the character of Christ in you. And as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. And so as we, we marry each other, you know, it's like God is using that other person in our marriage, you know, to, to sharpen us, to create something beautiful in us. Guess what? If that person was just like you, you never change. You'd be the same person you were when you married them 20 years later because you'd both had the same issues going on in your life. But because we marry someone different to us who... <laughs> Sometimes offends us. Come on, let's be honest. Who sometimes offends us. We did have two people last week say they had the perfect spouse. So, <laughs> But, you know, we can get offended. You know what? What do we choose to do after we get offended is what will make or break our marriage. So I'm not just talking about, you know, church stuff here. I'm talking about, you know, everything. And I'm not having a go at you if you're, you're divorced or whatever. I'm, I'm just talking about God's plan and the sanctity of marriage. So, to finish off, how to give forgiveness. Amen? Because that's what we're about today. We want to get over a fence and we want to give forgiveness. So how do we do that? Well, there's three things we need to do. The first one, you must decide. You must decide. True decision always precedes change. If you don't decide, if you're waiting for emotions and feelings to come, you'll never get there. You will never, ever get there. You just graduate to university and be in unforgiveness. You cannot change without making a decision to change. You know, if I'm in a car... And I, I want to go to a place, but it means I need to turn left to go to that place. If I keep going straight, I'm not going to get to that place. You know, well, the road looks prettier when I drive straight. You know, look at that forest path. I, I want to drive that way. Yeah, you can drive that way, but it's not going to get you to your destination. You actually have to change. You have to turn the wheel and go left to get to that destination. You have to, you have to choose to change. You know, I'm teaching my son to drive at the moment. Pray for me. <laughs> Every day I have to choose to get in that car to teach him. I don't want to get in that car. <laughs> it's a scary thing. Yeah, he's doing okay. I, I don't want to give him too bad a rap. But, you know, you have to choose because you love him. And, you know, you want him to be safe and you can't afford 60 or 70 bucks an hour to pay someone. <laughs> so you've got to do it. You know, I taught my wife to drive. It was the hardest thing we ever did in our marriage. <laughs> I was talking to someone who will remain nameless, but they just raised their hand. That <laughs> they, they had a lot of difficulty when he was teaching his wife how to drive. But seriously, you know, it was, the, it was the hardest thing in our marriage. We got, got offended every day. <laughs> Here we are, 25 years later. We dealt with it. <laughs> she said she's still offended. <laughs> 
<laughs> she did tell someone about what I did. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you because then I'd be offended. <laughs> We must decide. Every day I had to decide to get in the car and teach my wife to drive, even though I knew that there'd be a fight or there'd be some kind of offence. I had to choose. And at the end of the day, when we'd had the fight, I had to choose to forgive. And she had to choose to forgive. Well, you're saying you haven't forgiven. (laughs) So, you know, we have to choose. Or she's not going to drive and I'll be have to drive her around for the next 40 years. <laughs> Take the, you know, the short-term pain and get the long-term gain. Forgive. Choose to forgive. You must decide. You must decide. Love is not a feeling. It is a decision. You can wait all day for your feelings to change. But what is needed is a decision. You know, I could wait all day till I'm I'm feeling ready to get in the car with Daniel, you know. But he's not going to learn to drive that way. I have to make a decision to get in the car and, and let him drive. And he's getting better, praise God. Your prayers are working. You must decide that you want to fully forgive them. It's not like, well, I'm going to kind of... Forgive them today and tomorrow I'm going to be angry. (laughs) 20 years time I'm going to remember and I'm going to tell everyone about it and I'm still going to be angry. You must decide to fully forgive them. Even if your emotions aren't there yet, they are not the real you. And listen to this, this is so important. Your emotions are not the real you. They are just a part of you and they are not the spiritual you that makes decisions. Listen to this. This is what emotions are. They are the you that wants to drag you back to the past and your pain. That's what they do. When, when they drag you back to a place of unforgiveness, they are the part of you that wants to create pain in your life and hold you in the bait, the trap of the enemy. That's what they'll do. You must decide. Don't wait for your emotion. Don't wait for your feeling because they'll just keep dragging you back to the offense. And if you wait for them, you'll be waiting your life. They are the part of you that wants to pull you back to a place of pain. Don't choose your emotion. Choose the Word of God. Okay. Number one, you must decide. Number two. Stop rehearsing the old stories. Now, when actors want to act in a movie, what do they do? They rehearse their lines, right? Because when they're on camera, they've got to say those lines perfectly. So they rehearse them. And have you met a person who has rehearsed a story so well that like it just comes out? You know, and it comes out all the time, and they are always rehearsing the old stories of what happened when we taught her to drive. Or <laughs> we are rehearsing the old stories of what this person did or that person did. Stop talking about the people who hurt or offended you. When we keep speaking about them in a negative way, we are speaking death, sickness, disaster, and filth over them but more than that because you think yeah they deserve it they deserve all that filth no what happens when you drop a nuclear bomb there's fallout you know that mushroom cloud that goes up in the air and falls out over hundreds of kilometers you know when you drop a bomb of unforgiveness on someone there's fallout and the filth and the muck and the junk stinks on you you see you can't just think Yeah, I want them to stink. I want them to be filthy. No, it will stick to you because the fallout of that bomb is going to stick to you. The Bible commands us to pray and do good to our enemies. So number three is bless your enemy. Let's read Romans 12, 14. Bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. Um, 
Why is that in the Bible, Lord? <laughs> Sometimes, you know, you wish you could get like a, an eraser, you know. <laughs> bless and do not curse. So number three is bless your enemy and do not curse them. You must learn to become subject to Romans 12 verse 14. You see, we must not just do, you know, talk about the Word of God, but we must actually act on it. We must do it, not just talk on it. And, you know, we are not submitted to Romans 12, 14 when we keep talking about those who have hurt us. We are not submitted to God's Word. We are submitted to our pride and our hurt and our offense. You must learn to become subject to Romans 12. Blessing in our mind is often giving something. This is nice, but the Greek word here, this word blessing, the Greek word here is to speak well of. That's what it means to bless your enemy, to speak well of. Because you can, well, here's a hundred bucks, but I'm going to tell everyone how bad you are. I blessed them. I gave them a hundred bucks. No, the, the blessing is to speak well of. You will be confronted with daily opportunities to speak blessing into the lives of people who hurt or offended you. Someone cuts you off in traffic. Lord, bless them. I love them. Lord, they must be having a hard day. They're not thinking about what they're doing. Bless them. Your spouse, you know, comes home late. Bless them, Lord. They must have had a hard day. I just speak life over them. I speak love over them. You know, you will be presented with daily opportunities to choose whether you bless or curse. Be willing to do it. Example, talking about your spouse negatively. You may as well get a flamethrower and burn your marriage. Get your marriage certificate. Get a flamethrower and burn your marriage certificate because that's what speaking evil of your spouse is doing. You're basically taking a torch to your marriage certificate and burning it up because you're speaking death over your spouse. You're speaking death over your marriage. So when you speak things negatively about your spouse, about another person in your life, about whoever, you're speaking death over that relationship. You are a thief because you are taking life from that marriage, from that relationship, and you're speaking death. What are we told in John 10.10? The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. Jesus is speaking, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Music team, you can come up. What are we speaking? What are we doing? Are we speaking life? Life abundant. Are you speaking life over another person? Because that's what it is to bless that person, to speak well of that person. Otherwise, we're just a thief, come to steal, kill, and destroy. And every time we speak not well of someone, every time we speak negatively of someone, we're stealing, killing, and destroying that relationship, even if they can't hear us because we're pronouncing it with our mouth. What are we told in Mark 11? You will have what you say. You will have what you say. And so I encourage you all. <laughs> Guys, this is not about, you know, smashing us today. This is about setting you free. This is about being set free from the scandal on, from the bait, from the offenses that take us to unforgiveness. And we're going to have a, a time where we're going to, we're singing now, we're going to worship and uh, we can all go praise God. Part three is finished and there's no part four. <laughs> but I want you to ask the Lord if there's anyone that you're harboring offense of in your heart. If there's anyone you've been speaking ill of, that you make a decision today to choose 
to make a decision to forgive that person, to never speak of it again, and to speak well of that person.